Elizabeth Beisel in the house. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. I feel like I found a long lost friend. I haven't seen her in such a long time, but anybody who's ever had contact with Liz Beisel feels an affection and feels like you're part of her story, even though you may not have seen her for years. And oh, she's on Survivor. Oh, she made a mistake on Survivor. Oh, she had to write about that. Oh, and now she's got a new book and everybody can kind of check in and live with it. And you know, if you watch the show on a regular basis, and if you don't, welcome, that Fridays are great chances for us to kind of just spread it out, no contemporary issues, because we record the show on Thursday. Which means that if all heck is breaking loose and God forbid the coronavirus explodes in America, we'll take care of it on Monday. I don't know if we'll take care of it, but uh, you gotta keep your sense of humor, folks. You really do. So welcome in, and with no further ado, here's the book. You gotta do a book deal. Yeah, I got to do a book deal. Silver Lining. What a great picture of you, by the way. Thank you. Long time no see. How I know. You good? Things are great. You look How are wonderful. You? you survived Survivor. I survived Survivor. I'm here. I'm living. I have to tell you, all due respect, I haven't seen that show since season two. <laughs> Trust me. There were so many people that were like, wait, that show is still on air? Right? Yeah. But it has and a it very is. loyal following or it would not be on the air. I agree. Um... Uh, you recovered from it? Yeah. Did it wear you out? 30 days of not eating. Um, uh, took a toll. I mean, my God. Definitely lost some weight. Don't recommend that's the way you lose weight. Um, but At all? At all. That is not healthy. Um, but mentally, physically, emotionally, very taxing. Um, they deprive you of all comfort. So no beds, no bathrooms, no mirrors. You know, you are in the wild. It is real. Um, and then... As soon as you come back into reality, you're implementing the foods that you normally eat into your diet and sleeping in a bed is almost hard to do. Your stomach is not happy with any type of food at all. Um, so it was a big adjustment coming back into the real world as well. But I survived. When, when did you get back? I got back in May. So okay, it's been... So, so it took a while to yeah. like acclimate. Totally. But it seems like you kept the weight off and look like you're in great shape and well, the whole thing right? trying to work out no, honestly I mean, yeah. now that i don't swim eight hours a day i need to like probably eat less i and work I, out I just, smarter i just don't think anybody can even they may try to imagine what it's like to be in the pool that length of time day after day after day after day after day but it's impossible to understand unless you're doing it i think so and yeah. i think swimming is that unique sport where because we're only relevant once every four years at the Olympics, nobody really knows the inside of the sport of swimming. It's not something as accessible as basketball or football or soccer. People aren't coming to our training camps and filming us. You know, it's you see us on NBC at the Olympics once every four years, and then aside from that, you really know nothing about a swimmer. Mm. So for the people out there that don't really know the amount of work and dedication and sacrifice that goes into the swimming world, it's it's a lot more than you probably think it is. Hmm. So not doing it as much yeah. anymore means what? Trying Only to an hour a day or yeah. Well, no. I honestly are you, are you done? Well, I'm done competing. Yeah. It, it was it was a toll, um, emotionally, physically, all that stuff. But I'm now trying to say yes to a lot more things that I couldn't say yes to while I was swimming. Whether that means traveling or taking different work gigs or writing a book, you know, it's. It's stuff that I now have time to do that I didn't have while I was swimming. And so that's been really liberating and it's been awesome to see life from a different perspective that I've never seen it before because I was a swimmer. That was my life for 20 years. I never knew anything different. Yeah, I went to school and stuff, but aside from that, my life was the pool. So it's nice to not have chlorinated hair every single day. <laughs> you sound really happy. I am super happy. I'm, I'm happy because, in, in the book, I do talk about it. Um, I had a very love-hate relationship with the sport that I feel like not a lot of people knew about. And I was lucky enough to end my career at a point in my life where I loved the sport. And I think for anybody in whatever it is that you do in life, whether you're an athlete or you're Dan York, 
If you finish your last day loving what you did, you're going to feel really good about the amount of years that you spent doing it. And so for me, I was able to end my swimming career on a really good note. Um, I talk about the downs as well because I'm human. My career wasn't rainbows and butterflies like maybe some people thought it was. Um, but I was able to end it on a good note, accept it for what it was, um, and then use that to leverage myself into a future because I sort of dealt with a lot of friends walking into the nine to five world and getting quote unquote real jobs. And there I was still in the swimming world doing clinics and public speaking and stuff like that, but not nailing down the typical job. And I almost felt self-conscious about that. Like, oh my gosh, like, what am I doing? Like, should I just move on from this swimming thing? I don't really know what, it was just me comparing myself to others, honestly. Um, and then I finally woke up one morning and I was like, screw that. Like, I love swimming. It's what I'm good at. It's what I know best. So why not try to make at least somewhat of a career from this sport that I literally gave my life to? You know, I, w I would be stupid not to. So I'm happy because I'm doing that. You always wanted to swim. Yeah. Mom and dad didn't force you to swim. Never. No. They probably hated that I wanted to be a swimmer because well, you get it. Being a swimmer is hard. And yeah. being a swim parent, right. driving the kid to practice every single day, sitting at a five hour long swim meet to watch your kid swim 19 seconds. It's like, wow, that was fun. Yeah. You I, know? I, I, if you've never done it, you know, I, I did do it for six, seven years. Oh. And a Saturday is probably eight to 10 to 12 hours sitting in hallways of a school somewhere okay. for the cumulative potential four minutes worth of competition or yep. five or maybe eight if they qualify for something right. uh, that they may compete over the course of the day. And um, hockey parents had their own sacrifice. Swim parents mm -hmm. are definitely sacrificed. But, but your mom, yeah, your, your dad was always kind of, you know, behind the scenes and, uh, and a quiet observer and just a great guy. Your mom got very involved and she's an official. She's still yeah. doing the official thing? Still. I mean, Almost yeah. every weekend. And, yeah. And, and so she, she embraced the sport in a way that was well past just cheering for you, yeah. which I thought was really cool. And I loved it, too, because I was lucky enough to have dad, who you hit the nail on the head, very behind the scenes, mm. didn't go to very many swim meets. He was always the one making the money for us to fly me to swim meets and go to practice and stuff. And then mom was the opposite end where heavily involved, was the official, knew a lot about swimming. So I, I sort of had a nice equilibrium where if I needed to get away from swimming, I'd hang out with dad. Or if I wanted to talk about swimming, I'd hang out with mom. Mm. And they just really complimented each other in a way that I think contributed a lot to my success as a swimmer. Well, you know, not, not to make it all about mom and dad here, but the, the, what I think is really important uh, for for parents of, of superior athletes and, and superiors under, understatement for what, what you achieved, not only here but worldwide. Your dad, uh, humble, mm -hmm. and your mom, incredibly empathetic, yeah. uh, and, and, and enjoyed the successes of a junior varsity swimmer, you know, doing a personal best, which may have been three minutes behind what her daughter could have done, really uh, helped, I think, your reputation too Absolutely. and and kept you uh, moderated for the success I mean the dominance you had in high school never mind in college and in, in the country in the world was so superior that you could have been a real mm -hmm. oh I know you could have been yeah and you <laughs> and you never were yeah you and then that was that, that's something, you know, I'm looking forward to reading the book, just got it on my desk here, but yeah. it's, am I getting this copy? Yeah, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, I hope you recognize that's part of your silver lining, the way you were yeah. able to comport yourself through at least the time that we knew you when you were young. Yeah, yeah, I do. And I know that it's because of my parents and coaches and teammates, and I... I do see people that have had great success in whatever it is that they do, sports or not, um, and they are sort of that, like, not great of a person. You know, they think that they're better than you, but when I go to clinics or wherever it is that I'm interacting with people, I always try to humanize the fact that, yeah, I'm an Olympian, but the only thing that I probably do better than you is swim. Other than that, we are on a very equal playing field. Mm. and. Who cares if I can swim a 400 IM faster than you? 
who cares? You can look up to me for that if you're a swimmer, but aside from that, there's no reason to put me on this massive pedestal, in my opinion. Like, let, let me inspire you, but also understand that I am a human and I deal with the same things that you're do dealing with and I make mistakes, you know, I mess up, but we move on from that and we always give our best, so. When we come back, the pursuit of gold. <sighs> Next. There you are on the road again uh, in typical Liz Beisel fashion, you know, commiserating. By the way, I, I will tell you one of the things that, w that my daughter and I do boast about is that she did beat you. I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. High school meet. Katie York. Yeah. There she you beat go. you. 200 yard. What? 200 what, yard. Was it freestyle? Freestyle. She yeah. beat you down the pool the first yeah. time. She and I, she and I, she said, Dad, this is unbelievable. I cannot believe I'm in the pool with Elizabeth. I said, well, you got to beat her. She's like, what? I said, yeah. You'll always be able to say you beat her for 25 of the 200 yards. <laughs> I, I don't think, she did. She touched the wall before you did. That's awesome. I don't even remember she finished the race, to be honest with you. She was so gassed. That's but, okay, but she beat me for 25 <laughs> yards, and that's you all know, that matters. That was, you know, that was... <laughs> That was, we'll you know, take the small victories. But you know what? That's what that's what that's what the greatness does. It it makes it makes people aspire to that greatness. Um, and again, if you if you treat it in a humble fashion, it, it even makes it more uh, enjoyable for everybody. You are writing about all sorts of things, silver lining ish. I am guessing, based on a narrative we found on the internet, that the near miss on a gold medal is one of the things you've had to cope with yeah right because this is this narrative that that you write which had me hanging and then cuts off you talk about the, the this this final this this you know medley final and and you write once I hit the freestyle leg a second win came knowing I was about to do what I dreamed about since I was a little girl a hundred meters left and I accomplished the goal I spent the last 12 years chasing despite that I know I was the, the, despite that I knew I was first I was killing myself to go faster I willed myself I wanted to go as fast as possible I literally was thrashing to the pool doing everything possible to hold on, hold on to as much water as I could just a little farther than I was there this was it Olympic gold finally and the narrative stops on the <laughs> internet and I went Oh my God! <laughs> and then I start researching. A little cliffhanger. I'm like, I know See? everything about Get this woman speed swimming. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Finally, and it stops. Yeah. What? Wh where is it after? What? Finally, what? I know. So you got you got caught at the very end. Mm-hmm. And not from the not from the swimmer. I think you were eyeballing the entire time. No. It was from the other side of the pool. Came out of nowhere. Right. And a lot of so so that moment in my career was super defining because. The media heading up into it, and even myself, I believed I could be the Olympic gold medalist. And since being seven years old, that's my dream. I want to do that. So I'm finally at the point of my life where I'm going to make this happen. I'm touching first at the wall. I have a minute left of swimming. And I am in my head telling myself, I'm about to win an Olympic gold medal. And then out of nowhere, this girl who I've never heard of before, don't know who she is, passes me as if I'm literally stopped. And I remember touching the wall after that 100, getting silver, and really not even celebrating, but thinking, what just happened? Like, I was supposed to win, and I didn't. And then comes the wave of guilt where I've just let my country down. And I think that's a weight that a lot of Olympics, Olympic athletes hold on their shoulders for a while is, we were supposed to win gold. We're supposed to be the best as American athletes. And I came up short. And I came up short personally for my country, for my family, teammates, coaches, whatever. And so then I found the internal battle for years was, I am so excited that I won an Olympic medal and it's silver and that's really amazing. But also it was such a disappointment at the same time. And it sounds crazy verbalizing it and saying it out loud because anybody, even me now at 27, I'd be like, I'd love to be second best in the world at something right now. I'm not anymore. But I'd love to go back to that moment and actually appreciate what I did instead of being like, you messed up, you know? The president that's in the stands right now, he wanted you to win gold and you didn't. My parents, they wanted to win gold 
and I didn't. And so it was, it took years of me sort of healing and realizing that even though I never became a gold medalist, it's okay. Like, I, I still did good things. Oh, I'm sure you've had enough consultation on this. You don't need a shrink, but there's no way you could go back and be better at it. Right. And I, and I There's I no way you can go back and be better at accepting second. Right. Because it was in real time. Mm -hmm. It was all you were trying to achieve. It's only in time with maturity, reflection, right. that you come to that understanding. Mm -hmm. That's what life is all about. Yeah. Uh, I think most of the world, at least in... You know, I remember watching it. We weren't upset. Yeah. We were. We were just crushed for you. Mm -hmm. And here I am feeling crushed for you. Right. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And it's like. Well, it's part of that. Again, it's the relationship that you build with your fans, the people who are your friends, your family, and the people who just feel like they have an association, or that distant spectator who is watching right. an American swimmer, and mm -hmm. boy, I hope she wins it. And you know, they, their, mo their moment of disappointment lasts for about two and a half minutes. Right, and then you they're know. over it. Right, but everyone. But you came home to a grand celebration. Yeah. You know, did that help when you did? I mean, you came back and the, you were there at the school field, and everybody was nuts for you did it start yeah. to soothe then or it's just been something that in the end there's still a part that you've got to be able to live with reconcile because it's about your personal journey not ours right? right i i do think that welcoming home helped because another thing that i like to always talk about is that like when i'm at the olympics olympics racing i have no idea that people at home are watching i figure people are watching but i don't know that it's hundreds of thousands of people if and you did, it would get it would it would mess your focus up. Right, it would freak me out. So mm. so what I do at the Olympics is I shut my phone off. I don't touch that thing for eight days, and then as soon as I'm done competing, I open up the phone. I send the thank you text. Oh my gosh, you guys are great. Thanks for the support. But you're in such a focused state of mind, you don't want any outside distractions. So for me, coming home and seeing North Kingstown High School filled with hundreds of people. It shook me to my core because I was like, wait, this many people care about me swimming? Like, it just, like, it never clicked for me while at the Olympics. And so when I come home from the Olympics and I see this many people there and it's like, wow, like that, that does actually make me feel better. You know, these people aren't mad at me for not winning a gold medal. But then you go back to reality and all, you know, all the fanfare stops and life goes on and then... You know, I'm back at school or at practice thinking and thinking about that gold medal that I didn't win. And I've definitely since healed, but I would be lying if I said I didn't wish I was a gold medalist. Of course oh. I wish that. But Duh. Right. But I, I'm, I'm done swimming. <laughs> that ship has sailed. Good segue. What's next? Stay with us. All right, so you survived Survivor. I, to be honest with you, I don't even get what trouble you got in there. But so I'm not, I'm not even, I just yeah. like, you know, it's, phew, that one That one goes by me. We'll let that one go. Yeah, you know. <laughs> did you talk about it in the book? No, it's, no, it's no, this early. is just yeah. swimming. That one was yeah. uh, whatever. I, okay, so you learned a lesson. Okay, whatever. Yeah. You, know, you know what, you've started yourself for 30 days. You're going to make some personality bad decisions probably. Right. Yeah, it seems to me, right? You're probably right, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> You know, life's a, a, a learning lesson. Yeah. You are uh, new news. Uh, you're fairly glib. Yeah. So I'm guessing right. uh, communications and speaking of some kind is in your future. You've actually done some network stuff already. Yeah. And that must have been a kick. It was so fun. Yeah. Actually, great news. Um, so I auditioned with NBC Olympics a couple weeks ago to sort of get myself in the pipeline for sports commentating, yeah. for swimming specifically. Right. Um, haven't heard back yet, but. Really excited oh, for I'd, that I'd, possibility. I put money that they bring you in there. Hopefully, yeah. Because it's fun. I'm like you've marrying already, two of my favorite things. Right, you've already done it, yeah. and and um, you explode through the camera. So I'm sure yeah. that that will. Uh, I'm sure that will turn out long term, though, rather than just project work. What are you I thinking? Th I think it would be more long term. At least that one scenario where I would get into the pipeline and I would oh, to do be their regular. Right. So regular. I wouldn't totally take over yet, but I would do maybe smaller meets. And then... What about past swimming? Past swimming? Yeah, other, other than swimming. Oh, oh, Broad, past swimming. Broadcasting past yeah, yeah, yeah. the swimming thing. Got it. Um, action begets action. You do well there. They'll say, hey, right, Liz, what do you right. think about this? And I, I love all sports. And sports yeah. is my passion. Like, I just love 
I just love them. And so even if it's swimming at first, but then that turns into baseball or soccer or whatever, um, I would never say no to any of that. So hopefully something within sports. Your public speaking, is it themed, focused on something? I do like to focus on like three, I have like sort of three core values that I talk to athletes about. And then I change it if it's a corporate setting, but it's working hard, believing in yourself and finishing what you started. And I think those are things that anybody in the room listening can do. I'm not asking anybody to have God-given talent or be the tallest or the most muscular. Right. And so I talk about stories that coincide with those themes and be like, hey, these, these are resounding you know, themes within my career. I gotta tell you, I think the first two are um, normal. Yeah. The last one is your most important. Finishing what you started. Well, you know, it's funny. It, you know, swimming, athletics of any kind, whatever athletic learning you may have done, and of course, 99.99999% of people don't achieve at your level. Yeah. But my daughter and I have, from swimming, a theme. And whatever things get tough, we just say, swim through the wall. Yeah. Swim through the wall, which is a, you know, something that coaches would tell you. Swim through the wall. Right. I mean, just, just, you know, the test is going to be hard. Swim through the wall. Mm -hmm. Finish it. You know, this interview is going to be tough. Swim through the wall. Yep. I don't know if I can get this job. Swim through the wall. These are things that athletics can help you totally. learn, right? And that can basically carry over into any realm of life afterwards. Yeah. And for me, I think to go back to my parents, one thing that they did for me during my swimming career was I would want to quit all the time. Every athlete wants to quit at some point in their life. And I'd be like, Mom, Dad, like, I want to quit swimming. I don't like it anymore. And they'd be like, that's great, but you're going to finish the season. And if you still hate it by the end of the season, quit. But you're finishing what you started. That's what parents got to do with their first kid semesters in college. So many kids freak right. out after a semester. It's like, like this is finish so hard. the year yeah. and then decide. Yeah. And you end up loving it. Yeah. It's a fine line between parents you know, demanding what you need to do and giving you the room to experience the decision for yourself, right? Right. right. But I was lucky that I, I knew that I loved swimming. I guess that's sort of my example within this, but my parents were also not hard on me, but they're like, we're investing our life in this. Yeah. You're going to see this through. Right. You know what I mean? Like, that's only fair. It's you a know? team sport in a way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I'm lucky that I had team players through my parents driving me 45 minutes to practice there and back every day. Right. So I don't blame them for telling me that. And Well, look, uh, the book is called Silver Lining. Make sure you get it from, you know, at, at stores, wherever the books are sold. And uh, I could talk to Elizabeth all day. Well, we'll schedule her for the radio show soon, and I'll let you know when that's going to be. Congratulations on everything. You're the best. Love that smile. Final word when we come back. We'll do uh, our best to check in on this coronavirus story, the real story, not the panic story, next week. I hope you have a great weekend. Smile, relax. Good night.